Hello, you're listening to 101 Part-Time Jobs. It's the podcast where I speak to bands about their old careers, their old vocations, the trouble they've got up to. I'm on a summer break at the moment, spending more time going on more walks to more pubs. But this band, Cheap Teeth, have just released a new single. It's called What A Feeling, What A Day, and it's just totally excellent. You can catch them on tour in September and October, playing all around the country with Youth Sector. I highly implore you to go follow them and see where you can catch them. Cheers for listening to the podcast. This is episode 158. I've just made the first 101 episodes available for a one-off 10 quid. It was something I've been thinking about for a while to do, putting a paywall up for, for a bunch of episodes. But I thought upwards of 100 episodes for a tenner. Well, see how it goes. 101 Part-Time Jobs is supported by 2000 Trees Festival, which sold out this year. You can get cheaper tickets for 2023 if you head to 2000treesfestival.co.uk. And if you're going to Arc Tangent Festival next weekend, you're bound, you're bound to have a blast. You're bound to have a blast. Cheers for listening. Here's Jack and Joe from Cheap Teeth. And a distant voice just said, decide, 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 decide. Oh, what a so Jack, you just said got fired or you started a new job I did I, well kind of both um I got fired and then recently I am starting a new job in the next the next couple of weeks a, a, a quite a relevant way I was I was let go because it wasn't logistically working um you know playing shows and and uh, and working for my my last employer who as a company were amazing um they were a great they, they were really understanding of the whole thing but when it got to a point where i had to uh book a lot of time off when rotors had already been put out i do weirdly understand it from their point like yeah i couldn't really be working there anymore <laughs> so. we're bootlickers we 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 see the we see the masters we bow down to the masters we understand them that's it. Well, it's interesting because I actually got fired from a workers' cooperative, and I've been, I've been, uh, I've been asked who the hell fires you in that situation. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You've mentioned a few times, Jack, that it's kind of a bit Orwellian, and you're not sure like who, who, <laughs> whose choice it is in the end. But maybe it got put to a vote. I like the idea that it might have been like some sort of Big Brother eviction, <laughs> and you just went, yeah. No, it's not. It's not because I wasn't. It's like a more of a modern day cooperative where I was like contracted to the cooperative. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, I, d- I didn't have an equal share in the business as a worker or anything like that. I was a, I was a contracted employee to the cooperative and there is, there is a member, people who are members have designated roles and it was, there is a, there is a person whose role is the hiring and firing of, of employees. And he's a lovely guy, but, uh, you know, it just, it just didn't work out. Um, it's yeah, that's just the nature of it, isn't it? I suppose that's one of the reasons I'm I'm guessing you uh, even had the concept for this this podcast in the first place, Giles. Yeah, totally. Because that is the one thing that well, either you get fired or you can find a way to do it. And I guess I was interested in both sides of that because I love those stories. I love stories of people of getting fired. I mean, I've been <laughs> let go a few times myself. I think the reason it's funny is because we're so brought up to think that that's what we should do kicking back to that is you know subversive isn't yeah, it yeah 100 i think i think like yeah people kind of it's always spinning plates and and juggling and stuff and i think when you speak to other people they're very like you know you must be on the edge sort of thing but in reality like you know it, when, you get, when you get fired and stuff it's, it's not as bad as it seems and like you said you might find a way to kind of leave in a very kind of amicable fashion and if you're very honest with people, we've found that the more honest you are, the kind of the more kind of amicable it, it usually is. Yeah, it, fe- it feels amicable, but in like in the long run, so many people who I worked with, and there was a lot of people who worked for the company I worked for. I don't know if I'm allowed to like say what company it was. I guess I can. I was like a picker in the warehouse. He's a driver machine and stuff. Um, and there's a lot of people who work for them who are in bands because it's a workers' cooperative. Even when you're contracted to them they keep the concept of equal pay. So the hourly rate is amazing. So it's kind of good to juggle. You don't have to work that much when you're like a musician. Uh, and every other person who's in a band just told me I was like too honest afterwards as advice. They were like, you should have just pulled sickies. And, but I never did. I always told, I was, I was always straight about it. I was like, I've got a gig this week in, 
the Isle of Wight. I, I, I'm not coming in. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they weren't right happy about it. <laughs> well, you're going to feel better for that, right? I mean, lying or sort of hiding from it, you know, it, it never feels good. And then, of course, it's so easy to trip yourself up. Yeah, it's not good in the, it's not, lying in general is not, it's not a long-term solution. You can't lie forever, can you? You know, it, it'll, well, I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't come around. And maybe, <laughs> maybe liars win. But uh, Maybe we're the suckers. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I say sorry a lot. And if it's my, you know, if I, I like to own it because that makes me feel better because it's like almost like a bit of a line under it. There's something a bit ritualistic about apology though, even if it's like unnecessarily apologizing for something and no one's actually to blame, but like, I don't know. I feel like smoothing everything over after a, a tiff and just saying you're sorry, even if it's just, I don't know. I think there's something in that, that uh, well, it's probably more of an English thing really, actually, but I don't know. But the trouble is, is that once you've done that, if you're, if you're in a group dynamic, if you said, if you're the person who said sorry more than other folks, even though you've met, might've made the same amount of mistakes, you'll get known. You'll get known as the person who's yeah, fucking up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. yeah I'm yeah I'm a bit of a to be fair I'm, I'm a bit like you Giles I'm a bit of a sorrier people at work <laughs> in my old job have told me that uh, sorry people you say the sorry people <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you say if you say mea culpa I think they, that's that's a good way out of it because first of all you're cultural second of all they might not know what it means <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, mental let's leave him alone We actually worked in a COVID site for a bit. We worked there for way too long. And it was while the virus was running. It was just like, we was, no one was hiring. We were like, let's just do this. We'll move in together. We'll write a load of songs. We'll be on the same schedule sort of thing. The exact same schedule as well. We were like, we spent every minute of every day to get the 13 hour days at the COVID site, come home, make tea, drink 20 beers on your days off <laughs> trying to forget about how awful it was you know i feel like if either of us were 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 subjected to fbi style sensory deprivation torture uh, i don't think i don't think they'd get that much information out of us someone had come to like inspect the site and i'd locked jack in like a big shipping container and he was like banging on the walls like let me Oh, let me out like that. and someone had seen me like walk up and put him in this shipping container because i just had enough of him <laughs> um where did you pull that from i've completely forgot about that probably out of trauma and then i got brought into the brought into the office and this guy was just like why are you locking your friend in the cupboard like in, in, in the container and i just didn't have an answer and i was just like look i've got nothing to say I'm just, <laughs> I'm, i've been here for way too long staring at this white tent 12 hours a day i've gone insane and he's got he's got to have his time in the container and that's it <laughs> i mean that's sort of like one of the nice like sort of punk rock dreams i feel you know the bouncing souls i watched their documentary sort of early on when i was sort of 14 15 before around the time i was starting bands and just before sort of going on tour and I, and they all kind of worked together and lived together and practiced together and slept next to each other. And there was just this constant togetherness that I found really, you know, it's, it's a sibling thing. And I, I found that really attractive about being in a band. But I suppose there's going to be, you know, hanging out with each other constantly. That's its, <laughs> that's its own thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I, sw- I don't know. It, it goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Like, we, I think we're, we're really lucky because we do get on with each other. Like you see a lot of bands that end up tiffing when they're in that close proximity. And yeah, the, the whole thing of, I feel like in some way, however we carry on making money, you know, although obviously we have different jobs now, I could see there being a few crossovers in the future. Like we talked about, you know, in the end, the, the end goal is to kind of work for yourself and stuff. And I could see us having some funny like business ideas. We always kind of, we always bring them up um, when we're practicing and well on the day to day, I suppose we live together, don't we? But, but yeah, it's just kind of trying to like hold down a city and the jobs and get a balance that works. And like you said, you know, as you know, more than anyone, that's kind of hard to do. That longevity of it was, is something that I find interesting because things are changing every day. You might get offered a show tomorrow or you might not until next month. You kind of have to take things as they come. We don't have to, but 
you sort of want to, I imagine, take things as they come and basically on a penny change direction to prioritize the band. Yeah, and massively like at the, mo- at the moment kind of where we're at, it's, it's at that point really where it's at that quite volatile stage where it's like, if you don't take opportunities that come in quite short, you know, time frames, you kind of kick yourself afterwards if you don't take them. And, you know, like, you know, every opportunity kind of matters at this point. And I think that's definitely one of the reasons that I uh, recently ended up being being fired from my job uh, is because of the, the, yeah, the volatile nature of it at the moment. Uh, you've got a, bit, a quick turnaround on decisions and take shows in, in, in the time frame of like weeks rather than months do you have a different time sort of going if your mates bands playing you know going there as a punter i get a little bit kind of like a greyhound in the traps if i'm watching like other bands especially if they're my friends bands and stuff like i get a little bit like fidgety and itchy because i want to be playing myself but i i'm more like i love going to watch other bands like you know touring bands and stuff and we've, we've been really lucky recently especially in leeds to watch some great bands especially like brood now if you're you know, able to catch a band in there, it really is amazing. So yeah, it's, that's been so much fun. Where we practice as well at Mabgate, like there's like a real grassroots thing in Leeds kind of going on at the moment, which is good. Uh, it's nice because like, you know, you appreciate when you go down to London, but there's a lot of bands that we go and see around here that are, you know, on all a variety of levels and it's, it's really abundant and eclectic and creatively just great. It's good. It's really good around here. Does it help? Speaking to other bands, I suppose working at the co-op, you know, you were working with those people playing music. That's got to be such a, a key to kind of figuring out what you're doing, being able to kind of gauge and put yourself in context, how much you should be working, how much time you should be giving the band. Yeah, massively. I think it definitely did help working at the co-op. And, and before I worked at the co-op, I, I worked at the Brood and L, um, just like on the bar. Um, and that, you know, they were the first two jobs that I had once I'd moved to Leeds. Well, no, apart from the COVID site job as well, which, you know, that was in Halifax, but we used to commute over. But um, through those those two jobs in particular, being around creatives that are, you know, a variety of creatives as well. Like, you know, it's not just musicians, it's people who are like dancers and artists and stuff. Um, and again, at all kind of all levels um, that are pretty aspirational. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of seen how the balance is done both well and done badly. Um, you know, it's not, actually not that easy to do it working a bar job when you're trying to do something like that because you just you basically just skin and you've got to work a lot of weekends and late nights and you know, you basically just kind of get insomnia. Um and then you know, there's and there's a degree of that. The brood now wasn't that late compared to some some bar jobs that you could get in Leeds, but and then yeah, the the workers' cooperative seemed to be a really good balance. But you know, you've got to factor in stuff like the hours that you, you that you work in in terms of like my shift was two till ten at PM, and I used to work Thursdays and Fridays. Um, I used to I only I, I only used to have to work three days a week even though it was like graft you know obviously it was good that I didn't have to work a full five day a week but two of my days were Thursdays and Fridays and when you work until 10 p.m if we get a gig on one of those days it's not like I can even take a half day because I'd be finishing at six so like I just wouldn't be able to make any of the gigs whereas you know like Joe like and, and a few of the other guys when they've been working nine to fives at times like finishing at five you'd be able to take a half day on that and you could play anywhere in the country so it's not as obvious as being like the nine to five isn't isn't ideal and you've got to have something else like the workers cooperative stuff where they pay a good hourly rate and you work less days there's a lot of things to factor in i think that routine as well uh, working nights you you're gonna be tired the next day until early afternoon if you're working overnight you've done some some bar work as well joe when you worked at at Chiverinos because we've got kind of stages of like the current stage is like the Leeds thing but then there was like when the band was based in Edinburgh was a whole thing in of itself and that was a whole different dynamic and they used to both used to pack in a warehouse didn't you up there yeah I so said one of the things that Jack said when we did our crossover me and the guitarist we worked in a like a, a factory as well like you know packing meals that is during COVID time there's nothing else we could get it was like right at the start of the lockdown and we were 
packing like ready-made meals for old people, but they were like they were pressure pressure vacuumed, so they weren't refrigerated and stuff. And so it was like fish pie, and it had like you'd like drop one and it'd burst and it'd go off in about five minutes. So it was absolutely <laughs> rancid. And we like we were so desperate for work that we were getting up so early to get buses there and stuff. And it was just oh, that was that was probably the worst job I've had. I think. How did you find it? How did you discover that job? I mean, so I was I, I was unemployed, and the other Joe had, had done it, <laughs> and I was like, oh, can you get me a job there? And I think he was a bit like, I, you don't want this, <laughs> and I was like, I was so desperate. I was like, no, I'll come back up, I'll back to Edinburgh, and we'll go in together, and it'll be fine. And then I think we both maybe did like eight weeks or ten weeks, and it was way too much and so we had to get out of there um but yeah we, we both prior to that worked in hospitality in edinburgh while the band was in there and so did sandy as well the drummer we were all working hospitality so we all got affected by it so when the pandemic came we all had to leave our hospitality jobs and just scramble around for random stuff because we all quite liked hospitality you know it's hard working nights and stuff but it's a very sociable scene up in Edinburgh and there's, there's, of course there's not too many kind of cool bars. Everyone seems to know each other and there's quite a tight community. So it helped with the music and it helped with the gigs to getting people down to the shows. So yeah, shout out to Chiverino's, the pizza place in Edinburgh, if anyone knows it. Um, I worked there for quite a bit. So yeah, it was good. I mean, there, there, there's music in Edinburgh, right? Was it a case of, of finding it and finding, you know, finding stuff that you thought was cool? Yeah, I think the city definitely cares way more about the the ballet and the comedy. And so obviously you've got the Fringe Festival and they just fund a lot of stuff into that. So there's a lot of problems with licensing. You know, that's live music has to stop at 10, I think it is. And I know that bands like Young Fathers and stuff have campaigned really hard to get rid of that. Um, and that makes it really difficult. So you've kind of got to look a little bit harder, but I think because of the kind of the architecture of the place and the scuzziness and stuff, when you find those little dive bars or those little venues and stuff, you really get some kind of characters out of them. Did you feel quite far away from everywhere else? Um, No, not really. I mean, unfortunately, you find yourself going to Glasgow a lot to look for more music, and that had it. But um, I wish we could have stayed in Edinburgh more and more touring bands went to Edinburgh. It, it did have its limits, though. I get the, yeah, the main thing was that licensing thing. I do always forget about that. There was one time where we got, like, cut cut off, like, in the, <laughs> in the middle, in, like... Yeah, we got... We, I think it was one of our first gigs we, we were playing and it, there'd been, like, a problem with the schedule and they got pushed back and pushed back and the guy was like, oh, you've got 15 minutes or whatever. And then we were like, nah, we don't. We're going to play a full set. And we were halfway through the set and they turned all the lights on turn all the power off or anything like that we just had to walk off <laughs> how did you deal with that went all red i think everyone everyone <laughs> a lot of booing a lot of booing that came out not towards us but towards the promoters and stuff of course um, yeah i'm pretty sure what happened i think it was like a ticket cut situation and i think we just kept all the ticket money do you know like the, the old days where they like you'd have to sell tickets and then send the money back to them so i think i think we just kept it all and we were like it serves you right the pay to play thing is is savage. Yeah, you turn into a bit of a club promoter, flying on the streets and stuff. And I think we we got that a bit with Edinburgh because, like we said, we were limited with venues, and the venues there were great. We played in, but then when we wanted to go to other places, we had to really kind of stretch ourselves. And you'd end up find, you know, if you're kind of reaching out to these cities saying, "Can we play you?" You'd get those pay to play situations because you know they're not going to pay for you to come down some unknown band from Edinburgh and pay your money for it they're going to need you to kind of bring something so yeah we, we, we were kind of frequent to those at the start when we were getting going but we've all we've had some like you said the financial side of it's really really hard we've had to balance stuff if we went through some of the jobs that we thought about over the years whilst being in bands to fund it me and joe the guitarist we were looking at flu camp for a bit i'm pretty sure we were going to do like eight weeks and just get flu because we were desperate for money to pay for recordings. I know Jack, one time I was looking over, we were looking over Jack's shoulder and he was on farmjobs.com and he was looking at, he was looking at an advert for a job as a chicken chaser. <laughs> well, it sounded all right. Like, and I was like, at this point, I think it's probably a bit desperate. No, it was when, it was when we were working at the COVID site and it was because like, that was it like, it got bad did that like the whole place was like the people who were running it were like villains and they were just being horrible to each other and like 
we stayed out of all that stuff but then there was the the like sensory deprivation side of it as well which kind of drove us a little bit over the edge and yeah i i, I was looking at, at becoming a chicken a professional chicken chaser was the title of the job <laughs> People laugh at us sometimes for kind of having side hustles and stuff. I know my, my friend sort of mick out of me this year because I was trying to sell dining chairs to people on Facebook. <laughs> that oh, I yeah. bought from like an auction. I'd bought from some office auction loads of chairs and I was trying to sell them on and everyone was just like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, Where do you store them? Where do you store them in to... limbo? Where I, I would do just in our flat. I had loads of like office desk chairs and then loads of like breakfast bar stools that I'd bought no. like an office that had closed down. No, you were, you were buying and selling them, Joe. You were, they weren't already in the flat. You no, know? I know, but he said, he, Giles asked, where did I store them in the meantime? Oh, I see. Sorry. That's, my, my laptop's not very good to speak. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was quite funny because everyone, you know, the, the people I had on Facebook just had this advert of me, like office chair in Leeds. And it was just <laughs> like, for God's sake, what are you up to now? Like proper <laughs> devil boy in it. Well, the thing is, we were quite busy guys outside of the band as well. So that costs, you know, you've got social, you've got, you know, your social aspects anyway that cost a lot of money. So like that plus you're running a business. So people, people don't realize it's a business. It is a business. And if someone was investing, you know, a startup business and they were investing loads of money, you probably wouldn't question it anything but when you talk to people and you say well yeah this recording cost this much and this photographer or this press person and stuff they're like what as if i can't believe how expensive that is and you know they they expect you just to not do it because you're young and you're 20 but you know really when you're you're early 20s and you start you're having your own business it is a real kind of balancing act i think anyone close to us understands it completely because they get to see it on a day-to-day but i think we, we generally do a good job of juggling it And I think that means we don't have to have too many conversations with people and kind of explain ourselves because we kind of do get by and we do manage to fund things or everything ourselves. And we do manage to, like you say, be a little bit savvy in other times and apply for weird jobs and do the kind of odd jobs to keep it going. I think we've so far touched wood, we've done quite a good job of that. But, you know, that has only come from looking at adverts for chicken chasers and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just, it's all come to this basically, but I think we're in a good position now where we're balancing it quite well. Yeah, I think you're right. So I think like people in general are more understanding of that than you might expect, you know, like again, when Joe was saying that the people to, who are close to us kind of see it and then get it, you know, like there's no, there's, there's not really many people around me who like, you know, given the situation that I'm perhaps in at the moment of like, had a go at me for prioritizing you know a creative project over a a career in something else that isn't music necessarily you know that if anything people laud it because there's a lot of sacrifice that goes along with it do it to ourselves really i think we bring it on ourselves like if we'd have just had normal jobs We'd, we people people wouldn't comment, but when we're telling them about the stuff we've applied for, they kind of go, "Oh right, okay, really." And then it's a bit <laughs> like, "Oh right, we maybe we've got to explain." So, I know Jack, you had one the other week, didn't you, where you applied for? I was I was applying to write, uh, be a ghostwriter for a dating app. That was it. It was like <laughs> the role was like creative writer, and uh, you know my background's like English. I did English at university. Uh, so I was like, oh, score, you know, but it's one of those kind of like job advertisements that you see on in- on the Internet Explorer that kind of pulls you in off of the, the job title and then you look into it and it's a bit, a bit weird. I'd be writing for people on the dating app. So like you'd have to write people's profiles based on a bit of a spec and then uh, you'd be like messaging people off their profile. Uh, and I'd, I'd, well, I actually did apply for it and I didn't get it. <laughs> so, Sounds a bit suspicious, those. doesn't it? Yeah, I don't think they believed that you had the ability, ability to kind of impersonate Judith 64 <laughs> from America that way. Oh, and come think, on. Jack's got think, some cab. <laughs> they had like a, a test that you had to do. Like, in, like you know, there was like a, it was like a seven pronged application process. Um, and Bastards. one of them was that you had to, you had to, you were put into like some scenarios, you know, saying that you are you are Kenneth, you are from Chicago, your parents live in I don't know Seattle, you are twenty eight years old, 
you owe, I think the thing was like you own a tequila plantation in Mexico or something like that. And he was, I was like, this guy's quite young to be to be that successful. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then it was like you have received a message from Chloe, who is also from New York. You know, reply, and it was a bit like, ooh, weird. <laughs> and you was on, it was on a time frame as well, so it was like you have two minutes to reply to this. It was such a like American thing. To be fair, it was like. I remember there was like an introduction video about the about the company and it was just really cheesy, like, you know, innovation in dating experience. You know, <laughs> people who are too successful in their careers don't have the time to meet others. <laughs> you can help them. That whole concept did weird me out a bit. I was <laughs> I was kind of, you know, thinking if I was to get the job would it be morally correct because like i don't know it's a bit black mirror you know what i mean like, yeah yeah i don't think i don't think the, the date like the elderly dating ex- our experience of living in huddersfield would probably match <laughs> up to chicago dating scene very well either to be honest with you like this you know we've been in huddersfield where we've just seen freaky freaky old people just act weird and i don't think we've got a true reflection of you know successful chicago people yeah like that there was definitely a really a a very specific kind of target audience for it that i don't think we've even encountered those people you're gonna have to write a diary of of all these jobs it'd be so good to look back on we've had some normal ones like you know joe used to work in a record store yeah that was quite good shout out to loafers records it's in the peace hall in halifax shout out to mark and sarah who run it yeah that was good fun did you take on the uh, the real duty of uh, holding everyone who comes through the door in contempt? Yeah, I was the kind of like, you know, like look busy and then try really hard to not engage in a conversation about like mega death with someone who came in. You know I, mean? <laughs> I was like, just, just, you know, pretend like you don't, you're not knowledgeable because I will be stood talking to you for hours. <laughs> there are fewer like more how would you say, intense experiences than walking into a record store and you're the only punter that's in there. Like, oh, it's awful. A, it's, it is awful. Like, you've never actually thought about that. That's weird, Giles. What is I often that? get that thing, and I've had it ever since I was, like, the first time, I was lucky enough to have older siblings and parents who are into, you know, going to record stores. And I'd always have this thing, right, where I would have five records on my mind i'm like i'm gonna try and find them hopefully they have them i'd love to get them as soon as you walk through the door i forget what those records are and i just get completely like just into the fog of all this all, like, all these records i have the exact same thing i have I, I, i'm always like oh, i'll need to keep an eye out for this and then i go and then it's more like do i even know anything that's here and if you <laughs> do then i feel you know i feel cool yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you're not alone. You're not <laughs> alone. Me and Joe had the very same first part-time job when we were 15. Yeah, I was an underwater ceramic engineer, aka, AKA pot washer. That was my <laughs> CV. <laughs> so I was like, stick down the CV. I've done my time scrubbing these dishes. I'm out of here at 15. You know, I, I sat back in my rocking chair and lit my pipe and was like, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. And then when he quit, he like, I basically got the job because Joe was like, there's a job going there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't that bothered about revising, which, you know. I, d- I often found like if I was spending five hours doing whatever pot washing, I'd be like, man, I could have spent that five hours doing something way better. And then that kind of gives you the impetus to do that next time. Oh, 100%. I think that's literally the reason why me and uh, all of us in the band are, are so productive. Like, we're kind of like, we, we don't chill that much because we're quite, we get the context of it. Excellent. Nice one, Jack and Joe. Thanks for coming on. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much, you. Charles. Cheers, Charles. So there they were. Cheap Teeth's new single, What a Feeling, What a Day, is out now. Go and catch them on tour around the UK in September and October. See you in a few months when I'll have a full run of new episodes. If you've had any funny part-time jobs with some tales to share, you can email me at 101parttimejobspodcast at gmail.com and I'll read them out. See you then. I've been working all day. Te
This is a Mighty Moon Media Podcast.